profoundly and whether we're ready for it and try and tie it to the social pro uh, profit sector if I can through it. So it's a kind of a broad kind of the world is changing because the world is changing and we'll see how this comes. Now is that from the screen? No? So we'll see if it comes up. Nope. There's our technical person. It's here on this computer but not on yours actually. So give me another click on it. Okay. Is it coming up? Great. Okay, so I'm going to go through nine messages in the time frame that I've got. The first one is, world is changing profoundly, uh, and are we ready? And are we ready in kind of business? Are we ready in education? Are we ready in the uh, social profit sector? And my argument here is the drivers of change are affecting your business as much as they're affecting my business, as much as they're affecting government, as much as they're affecting kind of anything else. And let me just run through six of the major ones, and Matt touched on some of these as well, and I'll stop. I'll start at kind of 12 o'clock and run around. First, we've moved into a two-speed world, and we're not in the fast lane anymore in the rich countries. We're actually in the slow lane. We've never been in that experience in the post-war period. And what we're going to have to do as a country is diversify. That's true in the education sector. We've got to find new links in China and India, not just in kind of Europe. Uh, we're going to have to find new links in the business world. Interesting question eventually is, do we start to have global networks in the social profit sector to share experiences? You go down to demographics, think about it. Matt touched a little bit about the millennial generation. I actually worry about the opposite, which is this year, for the first time in Canadian history, we'll have a smaller proportion of Canadians working than we had last year. And that's going to be even more so next year. It's exactly the same in the United States. Europe actually is aging faster than us. And so we're going through a period we've never aged collectively as societies in the last 200 years. We are now. How do we handle that? One thing, which you know well, is that talent is now going to become one of the scarcest and most precious resources we have. So notwithstanding the fact that there's 7 going to 8 billion people on the planet, they're not in the OECD countries. We're actually aging, aging quickly. This came back from Japan. Japan is the first G7 country that will actually have a lower population next year than this. Think of that. What do you do? What's that do to your school system, your, your education? Thing? Yeah, you work your way through. So it is pretty profound. Uh, next one down is the global financial crisis. That's what the IMF means. I mean, it's almost like an endless uh, hangover. But what it's left us is low interest rates, low growth, and high volatility. And you live in that in your world of trying to kind of raise money because it's not the same as it has been before, and it's not going to go back to the old world very quickly. The one at the bottom, I think, is really important. Um, it's the decline in trust. If you look at the Pew Research uh, work in the United States, which looks at trust in leadership, not just political leadership, but, but leadership generally, it's at its lowest level ever. And it's been going down. It's not just you know, corporations. It's accumulation of things. It's environmental disasters. It's failures of regulators. It's failures of political leaders. It's failures of business leaders. It's failures in the education and sports field. But the problem now is it re it's reached such a level that when you announce something, there isn't the presumption of trust in what you're trying to do the way there was before. And that's not good. It makes, I think, politics harder. It makes public policy harder. But I think it makes almost anything we do harder. And I think one of my messages is work hard on the trust factor. Because if you can kind of establish the trust at the launch of whatever you're trying to do, you'll actually be way ahead of the curve. It is a fundamental change that we need to worry about. Uh, Matt talked about the information revolution. It's really, I, I worked on this from the government side a fair bit. Quite extraordinary where we've come in 15 years, you know, from the internet to Facebook. But, and to rear square, but actually my favorite one about how much the world is changing is what's going on in Syria. Syrians actually had a, an old view of journalism, which is they banned all foreign journalists from Syria and assumed that would keep news of the atrocities out. But anybody with a smartphone now is a journalist. And so you have 50, 60,000 journalists in Syria broadcasting. How it's going to change the way we do our business, whether it's in banking, whether it's in social sector government, quite extraordinary. Last one is pervasive globalization. If you think about it, we're seeing the reemergence of China. Asia accounted for about 10% of global GDP in the 1950s and 60s. It'll soon be 50%. China will be larger than the United States of America by the end of this decade. Are we ready for that? You know, we think about it in education, we think about it in public policy, we think about it in business. Um, how are we going to get our minds around that big a change? 
In Canada, all our economic and other ties are north-south. At some point in time, we're going to have to look at kind of diversifying at that. That's a big change that we all have to think about. So that's the world is changing. Second is in this profoundly changing world, I argue that one of the things we forget about is the importance of social cohesion and the institutions that support it. It really matters. In fact, I would argue if you look longer term, the countries that do very well uh, and are competitive long term are, are societies that actually have the rule of law, have institutions. In many ways, giving is a good indicator and correlator with actually social cohesion and stable institutions because that encourages you to do things collectively. When you have that breakdown, you just worry about yourself. And so it's really, uh, really important. I would argue as well there's a tendency to think about, you know, social cohesion. Is it a social issue? I'd argue it's an economic issue as much as a social issue. Is it a, a business issue? Of course it is. Business has just as much interest in social cohesion because it, was, it does in terms of stability. Is it just an individual issue or a government issue? The answer is it's all of those. And you sort of see that if you think when you look at the public resonance to the 99% versus 1% debate, it's not that the people necessarily agree with every point, but they're worried about the status quo. Do a little commercial for Canada. On the left-hand side, you'll see a ranking of the quality of institutions. Canada actually ranks one. I think that's a really important competitiveness indicator for Canada. Institutions matter. You, got, you don't get them for free. You've got to invest in them. What you do in the social profit sector is really important to that. On the right-hand side, it gives you the standard measure of income inequality, a great sense of kind of what stability is like. Canada, <laughs> we're very Canadian, we're close to middle of the pack, but we're slipping a little bit. But it is worrisome when you see the United States, income equality is rising, and I think that's certainly an issue of worry for the states, and we should worry about it here. But, so that's an area that I think you certainly kind of work and kind of live in. Third is, I actually think we often, this is true in government, private sector, universities, that we confuse leadership and managership. I actually don't think they're the same thing. I think they're quite different. And I think where they most matter, the difference most matters, is at times of profound change. If things are stable, then essentially you manage. But when things are changing, you need somebody, a leader, to step, out the, step outside the comfort zone of an organization. The problem is, kind of the easiest choice is the status quo. But at times of change, it's usually the riskiest choice. And I think the leadership question for all of us is, are we adapting fast enough to the changing global normal? It's happening regardless. Our challenge is we're there. And the left-hand side, you just see, in fact, leadership and management, you know, they, the, the value of leadership goes up in times of uncertainty. And a favorite quote from the president of the University of Cincinnati, who is a kind of business organizational expert, is, quote, underperforming organizations are usually overmanaged and underled. And so I think we should not confuse the two. Message four is that communications is key to effective change leadership. If we're going to have to be thinking about change, and as, you know, in fact, in many ways, Matt's speech was about change, uh, changing the communications medium and dialogue, um, communications is absolutely true. But if you're going to communicate, you've got to have a clear story, a narrative. You've got to be consistent, and you have to do it endlessly. The worst thing is to have a lot of relatively random communication that's not actually going to help you a lot. My fifth message, and I see this will come up later this afternoon, is that brands matter. In fact, all the study you see is that brands matter most in periods of uncertainty and change because they reduce uncertainty. They make you more comfortable. You, you're angst-ridden, but a brand actually reassures you. That's true in business. It's true in economics. In many ways, I would argue it's true nationally. A Canada brand one, attracts students, attracts research, attracts trade, attracts foreign direct investment. There's a gain kind of to it. And we should work more on Canada brands as we diversify around the world. We worry about kind of um, corporate brands. I guess one of my questions to you is, what about a social profit brand? Is there a need for a collective one for the sector? And I think you were raising some issues about kind of the collective view. Or is it just the individual brand, Princess Margaret, Hospital X, or Y? I would argue that in the corporate world, the more you get outside your established neighborhood, the more important kind of collective brands are. In China, you go in as a Canadian company. You don't go in as the company X. You sell the country and all its values, and then you sell your attributes as a, an individual company there. I think it's an interesting issue for your sector as the world becomes more complex. Do it, you just go with a single institutional brand, or do you think a little bit more of a collective one? 
And the challenge, I'll give you a challenge for Canada abroad, our potential brand, which is on the left, is think about it. Some of the best economic fundamentals in the world, robust natural resources and, and robust kind of human resources, sound financial systems, strong universities, strong institutions, it goes on. Our actual global brand is we're nice. And every single survey that Matt's company does or others do around the world, the only thing that pops up for Canadians is nice. Now, the, the sad thing is we're really happy with that being our brand. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not going to raise a lot of money just being nice. And you're not going to sell a lot of Canadian goods and services around the world because we're nice. So it's, it's a good, necessary brand, but I'm not sure it's a sufficient brand. So brands matter. You should think about the sector's brand. Six is the competitiveness is changing dramatically. You know, the choice, and this is really important for countries like the United States and Canada, is there's not a single way of being competitive. I think there's, it's almost bifurcated into two ways. You can either have continually innovating new goods and services, Facebook's a great example of how you do it, or you can be competing on standardized products at low cost and large scale, and we can't win in that world in Canada. And even the United States is having difficult winning in that world now vis-a-vis -vis India and China. So we've got to change our business model uh, in North America. And then we've got to change all the supporting thinking and education that goes with it. And the answer is that the only way countries, high wage, mature economies like ours can be competitive is productivity and innovation. And that's an issue for your sector as well as for the rest of the economy. And I'll just leave a couple of quotes here, but they're interesting. Paul Krugman, who's not known as a right-wing uh, radical, uh, quote is that productivity is not everything, but in the long run, it's almost everything. And President Obama, in his State of the Union, the first quote, the first step in winning the future is encouraging American innovation. Tom Friedman's got a neat little take on, on how this world is changing. And the mantra of the hyper-connected company, which in a sense almost is kind of geography and nationality free, his is the way they think, the way they operate, the mindset is, quote, invented here, designed there, manufactured elsewhere, and sold everywhere. And that's a pretty neat view of what globalization, innovation kind of means. And I kind of wonder if we're ready for it. Certainly at the University of Waterloo, I say, have we got that in our mentality? Or are we kind of sourcing the best and the brightest around the world and making sure that our kind of students and graduates come? Not clear. The last two just basically make the point that it, you know, if we want to be competitive with rising wages not falling, we've got to be a more innovative, productive economy. And that's good for your sector, because the more innovative and productive the economy is, the greater the chance of giving. The last and one of my favorite quotes is that research is turning money into knowledge, and innovation is turning knowledge back into money. And we've got to worry about both. Um, the challenge for us is that we actually have a productivity and a innovation problem in Canada. And I'll give you two quick little graphs. These are both business sectors, not the overall economy. If you look on the left-hand side, it gives you the ratio of productivity in Canadian business, aggregate compared to the United States. We've slipped down to 72% of the US. And frankly, our education levels are the same. Our kind of basic resources are as good, if not kind of better. And so we should really have to ask ourselves why. And the answer largely is we're not as innovative as US business for a lot of reasons. And you look on the right-hand side, and it gives business spending, business, not government. Government's actually the top of the list. Uh, spending on R&D, we're 20th amongst OECD countries. Slovenia is beating us, Iceland, Ireland, those other R&D powerhouses. And, and that's really not good for our future, and that's not good for the future in your sector either. So you know, the problem with TIG is to be competitive, you've got to be more innovative. And our challenge in Canada is that actually we've, been, we've gotten very rich without being terribly innovative. And we've got to worry about that in the future. Message eight is that we have a talent and research capacity. Just, I mean, gosh, just look at what our research hospitals or other institutions or universities can do in this country. We've got an enormous comparative advantage, provided we lead, not follow. And that's one of our challenges. And I would just throw up a couple. One is the new industrial policy is creative ideas. It's not subsidy. So how do we turn that in? You know, we have to become first class kind of innovators. We've got to turn kind of knowledge back into money. I think we've got oodles of knowledge in Canada. I'm not sure we're turning it back into money that can be re reinvested in all the things we want. We have to build a world class talent pool. Canada is very attractive to immigrants around the world. That's got to be one of our great strengths going forward in government. But I guess I leave the question at the bottom what does it all mean for the social profit sector? What would be your aim high objective looking ahead? 
because I think business has to have a stronger, clearer one. I think the university sector has to have a stronger, clearer one. I think government services, not kind of the political side, but the service side has to have one. But I think you need one as well. Message nine, and it's the end, is that Canada, I, I'm an optimist on this because I think we have extraordinary potential in this country. The key is we want to realize that potential. And we've got to make sure that we actually have a kind of richer society and a richer economy for our kids than actually we have. And we can do this both socially, economically, we can do it in the private and the public sector, but we've got to be clear about what our national interests are, and that's kind of our collective thinking. We've got to be clear about what our advantages are and where our disadvantages are. And we've got to be actually a little bit more creative and nimble. And I'll come up with, if I can, four things to leave you to think about. First is, mindset really matters. And if you're in a profoundly changing world, you've got to disrupt the status quo. Innovation is disruptive. By definition, it actually destroys the way stuff was and puts in place a better way of doing it. My favorite quote on this is George Bernard Shaw, who said, quote, you see things and you say why. Those are the protectors of the status quo. But I dream things that never were, and I say why not. And I think in Canada, we've got to do a little bit more dreaming. The second is the time frame. You know, Dominic Barton, who's the global head of McKinsey, but also a, a, a Canadian, a very proud one, has got a very evocative phrase in the Harvard Business kind of review that it's the tyranny of short-termism. He argues that you couldn't have built the United States you have today if the markets and people and journalism and others were as short-term today, uh, you know, 20 years back. And we've got to get back to taking longer-term views. And I think the social profit sector, kind of charitable giving, is about long-term views. It's about collective views. And the more you get trapped in the near term, it's actually really hard to actually ask someone to make an investment in kind of their kids or their grandkids, or the grandkids of people they'll never meet. That's actually taking a longer-term view. But winning countries, winning firms, kind of winning institutions ride trends, not events. And I think we're too trend, uh, too trend averse and not event, uh, kind of, we, we focus too much on events. The third is that strategy really matters. And, and you're, you inherently know that. You are a strategist. But think about it. They've got to be clear strategies. They can't be fuzzy. And you've got to have flawless execution. I remember the first time when I was in government and I worked on a tax policy and it came out and I was very proud of it. And I sent the press release to a kind of cousin that I, I really valued in Cape Breton. And she wrote back in that way that only a Cape Bretoner can, which is that's very nice, Kevin, but it hasn't affected me yet. And so execution really is important. It's not when we think it up and announce it that it matters. It's actually when it affects the people that we want to kind of have uh, affected. Uh, you've got to be early adopters. But most importantly, I think we have to heed the advice of a great strategist, Wayne Gretzky, which is that if the world is changing and diversifying, we've got to skate to where the puck is going to be not where it's been. And I think we stay where the puck has been a little bit too long. And the last is leadership matters. And I think all of this, in many ways, strong leadership will actually overcome a lot of the problems and in many ways leverage the strengths that leaderships matter. And I'll just leave you with a beautiful quote on leadership by Teddy Sorensen, who did a lot of the great writing for President Kennedy. And it's, quote, those who wish to stand up and stand out and leave something enduring behind must build new institutions, not new images. They must look to the next generation, not merely the next election. They must talk in terms of fundamental values, not merely cost. They must appeal to our hopes as well as our need. That's leadership. And that is exactly what leadership is. It's actually appealing to something kind of greater than kind of what we do and need day to day. It's actually thinking bigger. It's thinking about folks that you don't necessarily can know but actually you care about because you're part of a caring society and a country. Thank you very much.